Thank you. You can hear me all right? Yeah. Um, OK, thanks for the intro. Um, I, I was going to say some of that stuff, but I don't need to. The other thing I wanted to say, though, is that um, I've been using QGIS for about 16 years. And for most of that, I was like pretty set in my ways. I'd figure out how to do a thing, and um, I'd stick with it. But in the last few years, I've been doing a lot of QGIS training, so I've had to kind of rethink how I do everything. And so um, the couple of things that I want to talk about today are kind of things that I've picked up over the last few years that may be a little bit um, may seem like JS101 for some people, but they're new to me and kind of exciting. So, no? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I was just going to say, we're going to move really fast. So uh, when John starts to run out of time, I'm going to come up and just loom over him like this. That means he's got to speed up his slides. And yeah, yeah. I think we should go. And we should go. OK, and what, this green button is the one? Yeah. OK, um, all right, so right into it. Um, I, first thing I want to talk about is uh, user fonts, uh, automatic download of freely licensed fonts. This is new in version 3.28. Um, uh, so what it does, uh, new fonts, uh, set it new fonts panel in user settings. You can add your own user fonts. Um, and if you open a QGIS project or a layer that has a reference to a font that you don't have on your system, it will actually automatically download it if it's on a list of um, uh, certain freely available fonts. So the thing I love about this is if you're sharing projects and stuff with people on different platforms, I'm a Linux user, I work with a lot of people on uh, Windows platforms, I never know if they're gonna have the fonts I have now, I know that if I put these fonts in, they can open up their QGIS and they'll get those fonts. And also, if they um, are in like a, an enterprise environment and uh, they may not have local admin on their machine, they can actually add the fonts that they need to use. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, so which fonts are they? If, um, so that was probably gonna tell me there's a better way to find this out. But the way I found it out was uh, if you go into the GitHub repo, you can search for Google Fonts and find the whole list. There's about 1,600 Google Fonts, uh, which is, I, I don't think I'll ever get through them all. So that's pretty cool. Another hot tip here, if you don't already know this one, is any um, GitHub repo, if you just put in one S after the GitHub in github.com, you'll actually see the whole repo in a VS code um, in your browser, which is kind of nifty for uh, searching and, and modifying things. Um, okay, another thing I want to talk about is uh, PostGIS. So you may or may not know PostGIS was invented, or QGIS was invented as a viewer for uh, PostGIS Spatial Database um, about 20 odd years ago. And uh, so it's actually no surprise that they work really well together. So a few things, if I have time, I'm going to go faster. Okay. Uh, one of the things, if you um, are using PostGIS, one of the reasons you might be using it is because of the fine-grained user control. So there's some authentication stuff that I think is pretty interesting. Um, a few different ways you can do authentication in QGIS. Basic authentication, you put in your username and password, it gets stored in your project or layer. Uh, obviously not great for security if you're um, sharing files around. Um, so you can use authentication configurations, um, uh, uh, stores it in an encrypted QGIS database, this is pretty great. Um, your layer's making reference to um, a, a little um, ID, which means that if you're sharing with people, they have to have the same ID. So it can be a little finicky sharing things around. So the one I've been, uh, the way I've been getting into using it lately is using these pgservice.conf files, which means you have a, a, a text file in your user profile, uh, has all your credentials in it, and it uh, makes it a lot easier to share. Uh, well, I don't know what else can I say about that. Probably not much. <laughs> oh, am I really out of time? <laughs> you can have 30 more seconds, guys. 30 more seconds, okay. Okay, skip the other stuff. Notify, um, you can set up your PostGIS database to issue notifications when data in your PostGIS database changes. Um, QGIS can be set up to listen for those notifications. Um, and so that uh, if you have multi-user editing or if you're doing things like geofencing, or uh, asset tracking, or running, uh, you know, live tracking for dog sled racing in the Yukon, that kind of thing. It can be actually very nifty for that. So, over to you, Niall. Let's skip that. Let's skip that. Here, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, who knows what happened in 2020? Uh, yes, point clouds were introduced into QGIS. <laughs> uh, so since then, so since 2020, we've got support for 2D, 3D views of point clouds. Uh, you can do LAS, 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 EPT formats, and a whole bunch of others. If they're local or remote, they just work. Um, COPC is obviously another big one. Cloud optimized point clouds just work. They kind of stream. You get the little bits. You can view them really fast and uh, easily. Um, you've got a heap of range of styling for point clouds, like 
identify the classification, intensity, etc. Uh, you can identify points. There's, you can do eye dome lighting, ambient occlusion, shadows, they all work with point clouds. Uh, and you can filter them as well. Here's another really recent development for point clouds is uh, a thing called virtual point clouds. So that is if you've got like a data set of maybe 10,000 point clouds, you can turn it into a virtual point cloud and then it just works really smoothly, loads the tiles it needs as you zoom in and it's, it's kind of seamless like this. Uh, another recent development in point clouds in QGIS is the processing capabilities for them. So these are tools that come from PDEL under the hood but they're simplified and optimized so they kind of just work without hiding all the gory details away from you and you can run them through the GUI. So clipping point clouds, all that kind of stuff, you get a nice simple tool, you can put it into your processing models or your batch processes and stuff and you get a, that interface on it. This is all less than three years. So I didn't put enough exclamation marks in. Three years, like it went from zero, no point cloud support to objectively like best in class in three years and that's like, you know, testament to open source and how fast it can move and how rapid it can go. Uh, another new thing is this elevation profile built-in tool that lets you do the cross-sections so you can draw a, a line and you can see the kind of cross-section of your point cloud or your vector layers or your raster layers or your mesh kin layers um, and it's all interactive and it's really responsive. It kind of generates all that, that data in the background so you can interactively browse it and it's, it's fast. Uh, also, you can put it into your print layouts so you can get a a cross-section profile, put it into your print layout, and then even drive it by your atlas. So you could have like 100 pages and it's got cross-sections all through that road or whatever you want to do. Another really new one that came from a Cesium ecosystem grant is support for Cesium 3D tiles. This is coming in QGIS 3.34. Uh, what these are are basically like these digital twin models often come as 3D tiles. Uh, you can see here I'm looking at some data from Queensland from a site made by some pretty good guys. Um, also Google, Google Earth did a big sort of partnership with Cesium so you can get all the Google Earth data as 3D tiles and now you can put that data into QGIS. Uh, you can view them in 2D in your standard kind of map or you can view them in 3D and you get this awesome kind of streamlined thing where it's just getting the data as it needs and you, it loads the detail, it's really fast, it's really smooth and it's great and you get it in QGIS 3.34. Uh, something else I just want to point out here is every time we get to do work in things like point clouds or 3D tiles, it's also an excuse to make every bit of QGIS a bit better. So just as a really tiny example of this is um, in a recent QGIS version, there was a funded project to make point clouds better. Part of that as well, they fixed up the, the 3D tools so you can get a much better 3D measure tool that just works like, like you expect. It's kind of a a natural interaction. If you've tried to do the 3D measure tool in an older QGIS version, it was not good. Hey, I caught up. Hey, all right. <laughs> okay. So, um, cloud optimized geotiffs in QGIS. We've been hearing a bit about cloud optimized uh, data over the last couple of days. Um, this is one of the most commonly used ones, uh, but really nice, uh, really nice way to use raster data in QGIS for my money. Um, so um, you can start in cloud storage, um, you can, like am Amazon, AWS, S3, uh, Google Cloud, Azure blob storage, that kind of thing. Um, and you can store it in private buckets. So, um, uh, of course, so private means, again, authentication. A few different ways QGIS can handle authentication. Um, it's actually got an AWS S3 um, handler for that. Uh, if you've got AWS CLI installed on your machine, um, it'll read your configuration. Um, and you can even use environment variables that you can set uh, in QGIS. So um, this instance here, this is um, this is loading up a 70 megabyte geotiff from an AWS bucket with authentication. It's loading it in, and it's um, uh, it works pretty much seamlessly. As, I mean, this is a 70 meg file, but it could be a 700 meg file, and it probably wouldn't be any different. Um, but yeah, basically cloud optimized. GeoTIFF, it's compressed, um, it's tiled, it's got overviews, um, and using HTT HTTP range requests, it can just pull in the part of the file that you need. So it's actually a really nice way to handle um, really big rasters and not have to um, fill up your local file system. Um, this works better than uh, some of the networks, some of the, the local area networks that I work on, so. Um, 
vector tile base maps. So this is an example uh, from New South Wales in Australia. Um, this is, uh, I mean, they're really nice. They're really fast. Uh, again, cloud hosted. Um, QGIS has some really nice ways of, of consuming and using those things. Um, so for example, uh, ArcGIS, Esri vector tile servers. Um, you can load them in as a vector tile services connection. It'll read the files. It'll do auto style conversion. Um, converting from the Mapbox Esri style specification into um, QGIS styles, which means it reads it. You can you actually have access to all the layers that are in that vector tile base map. Um, you can turn them on and off. You can actually modify the styles. Maybe you don't want to have this national park be that color. Maybe you don't want national parks at all. Turn them off um, uh, and, and use them locally. So it also just works with uh, uh, VTPK support, uh, vector tile packages from um, ArcGIS Pro. Um, so you can drag and drop those in and have a, have a similar experience for, with those kinds of files. One uh, bonus feature that I think is pretty cool, oh, and thanks North Road and Slayer for that one, by the way. <laughs> um, and one thing, other thing that I think is pretty cool is being able to download those vector tiles. You've got them loaded in from a cloud source, but maybe you want to have them locally for some reason. Maybe you're using um, Emergent Maps or Kubefield. You want to put those things onto your device to take them offline. Um, this download vector tiles utility is uh, a really cool way to do that. Danielle is actually going to talk in the next talk about emergent maps and kubefields, so maybe we'll hear a bit more about that kind of stuff too. All right, over to you. Thank you. All right, uh, next thing I want to kind of highlight is a uh, relatively recent um, introduction in QGIS is uh, annotation layers. So what these let you do is just draw stuff on your map. So it's like for cartography, for things where you're like, I just want this text to be here and I don't want it to move around and I don't want to have to stuff around with vector layers and labeling and all that kind of stuff. You can just be like, put that bit of text there and make it stay there. Works with curved labels as well like this. You can, um, you know, you can kind of draw a curved line like for the bay and then just say, use the bit of text. Really good if you're kind of like me and you're into this sort of chaotic good style of cartography of I just want it there. I don't want to have to worry about the data behind it. Um, so you can do things like the put text items, you can put markers, you can put uh, lines and blobs and you get all the kind of huge styling options that you get for your vector layers for those. So for all, all those shape first fills and all the other kind of fancy stuff. Kind of just work, uh, data defined stuff works as well. You can go really crazy over the top with it. Uh, another map style and cartography improvement in recent QGIS versions that gets me excited is support for HTML in labels. So this is kind of like before. You could do expression-based labels and have you know bits of text coming from the name and the population and that. You could only give it one style range. So it's like one font, one color, one uh, bold or whatever, and it would apply to the whole bit of the label. And it was a, a big kind of limitation if you wanted to get certain effects, especially like this kind of thing. It looks bad when the, it's all the one font. Uh, but now you can do this kind of thing. So you can put those HTML tags into your label content. So I can make bits of it bold. I can use CSS to kind of uh, style different parts of that label in different things. Um, and then we get stuff like this. So now I could have the place name in bold, the population in sort of smaller characters and italics and it's, uh, it gives a kind of whole new range of options that we didn't have before. Uh, it works for colors, it works for things like bold, italic, underline, strike through, and then font family, font size, and probably more to come. Oh, and actually the other cool thing about that is it, it just works with uh, curved labels as well. So that same kind of HTML format, styling options all apply to curved text labels. Uh, another relatively recent QGIS development that I get really excited about is this special tool that is that comes alongside QGIS. So this QGIS process tool. Um, and what this does is it lets us get all those hundreds, thousands of tools that are available from the processing toolbox where all of QGIS's kind of transformation tools and data analysis tools sit um, and run them from outside of QGIS. So you can run them from a command line, don't have to have that QGIS window open and you kind of just use it as a tool. This has opened up a whole range of new possibilities with those QGIS analysis tools. So one thing that came out of this was this QGIS process R library. So there's QGIS underscore process is the 
utility. QGIS no underscore process is the R library. Um, but it lets you do this kind of stuff. You can just use all that functionality in QGIS from R really easily and it works with the plugins and all that kind of stuff that you've got installed for QGIS too. So that basically means that all those tools, all those hundreds of tools, you've now got a way to run headless, you can run them in containers and all that kind of stuff and it's gonna be quite easy. Uh, okay, another recent development that gets me excited is this GPS support in QGIS was completely reworked. This is an old screenshot of what it used to look like and it was really confusing and this kind of <laughs> old school UI thing of stuff kind of just chucked everywhere. That's all been junked and now it's a much more sort of modern approach, much more streamlined approach to get that GPS support and like connect your GPS device to your QGIS uh, and you get lots of options. Um, okay, here's another one, Arctis Portal or Arctis Online. Uh, you can, don't move that. You can load those layers into QGIS and it, and it like just works perfectly. So this even extends to you can edit those layers. You can load in an Arctis Online or Arctis Portal layer into QGIS. If that user has the permission set up so that they're actually allowed to edit, you can use all the QGIS edit tools just like you can a PostGIS layer. Um, and if anyone has ever tried to edit data using Portal, they'll realize that it's so much nicer to be able to use those QGIS desktop tools to just move the things around and stuff. Um, on a similar note, uh, GDB files, so Esri File Geodatabase, pretty common format, um, completely proprietary format, there's no specifications for it. It has recently been like 100% reverse engineered uh, and all this kind of stuff is actually coming from GDAL under the hood, but what it means is that you get the newest QGIS, you download it and you get out of the box full edit support for geodatabases. You can create them from scratch without even touching Esri software. You get to load in raster layers, so that's no longer like a siloed piece of information hidden away. Um, you can do stuff like create relationships, create domains, all this kind of stuff through QGIS and you don't even need that Esri sort of proprietary driver you used to. A really funny one actually is because you can edit relationships and create them in QGIS now, that was something that you needed like the top Esri license for, I think. So, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> right, what's next? Um, this is a good question because QGIS development isn't something that's structured. It's not like a pre-planned roadmap of we're gonna do this feature at this date, this date, this date. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Like you never know what you're gonna get until that next QGIS release comes out. Um, but a couple of things that are interesting developments on the QGIS side. One is because QGIS has had a lot of sponsors, a lot of organizations pledging money to it on a regular basis, they've now had the ability to hire their first full-time staff. That is being done at the moment for administrative kind of roles, like so there's a, a web developer and a full-time documentation person, so the documentation is gonna get a lot better. Uh, the website will get a lot better. Um, so that's coming through sponsorship growth the hope is that there'll be more full-time roles to keep the project going and do all that kind of annoying stuff that just has to be done. Um, and so yeah, basically uh, it, it's over to you. Like QGIS is a really special thing. It's an outlier in this world, I think. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really strong community-driven project and um, as a community, we have the opportunity to actually help shape that future. So. Um, we can take questions, um, but we're actually really keen to hear kind of what your thoughts are about where, where should QGIS go in the future? And so, yeah, over to you. Uh, so with that, um, that headless utility and the support for file geodatabase, do you see QGIS coming in to eat some of the lunch that FME is currently eating? I think it's already eaten some of that lunch, to be honest, and maybe there's uh, just the dessert left. <laughs> um, there's definitely a, a lot of uh, demand for a FME, for those FME users who are using QGIS to have like a alternative, I guess. Um, and QGIS is pretty close there. There's a couple of other sort of things that would be nicer in the model designer to make it a bit more of a um, equivalent, alternative, whatever you want to say. Um, they're coming pretty soon, to be honest, like there's enough demand and there's enough sponsorship coming in from those people that it's gonna fund that pretty quickly. 
Yeah, I should say as well that that QGIS process tool actually lets you run your models from the command line as well. So you, if you've designed a graphical model in QGIS and you put on all that flowchart stuff, you can just run it with the QGIS process. Mm. <laughs> I I love the um, HTML labeling uh, functionality. So any more that can go into that? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I do too. And uh, you know, without kind of sounding glib, it was like sponsorship welcome. Um, that that. All that stuff came from sponsorship, and it was kind of like, initially it was just color support, because that was the easy one, and then um, someone else was like, oh, I need bold, and I'll pay for bold, and then someone else got that. And it kind of just grew from that. Um, so yeah, that, that would be one way to directly influence that, but yeah. <laughs> hey, in my job, uh, we're ArcGIS mostly, so I enjoy using um, QGIS to consume the REST services and that sort of thing. I was wondering what other opportunities have you guys seen for that interoperability with ArcGIS and ARM and stuff? Um, it's, uh, today it's pretty good. Like the, the big ticket items have all been crossed off the list now in terms of it's easy for someone who depends on portal to use open source, it's easy for someone who has like a mixed environment um, with five gig databases, whatever they need to share with other co-workers to just use open source and their co-workers don't even need to know really. A um, uh, couple of maybe remaining bits. Um, so raster support in geodatabase is read only. It would be nice for that to be something that you could write and you could actually put geodatabase rasters into a geodatabase from the GDAL drivers. Um, Another one that is kind of a, a bit of a red flag in my mind is there's a concept of compressed geodatabases. It's a completely different format. So it's got the same extension, but it's a, if the user compresses that geodatabase, it's a like totally different way of storing all that data. That hasn't been reverse engineered. And every now and then you get a website that you download a GDB from and it's been compressed and then that's kind of a game over if you're using open source software. So yeah, I'd love to see a focus on working out that specification and then getting a GDAL driver for that so that we can open up that as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you want to ask further questions, you can come and use the feedback form at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.